Welcome to this webinar about Chapter 14, Biology. In this chapter, we'll be covering all three sections from Chapter 14, which is about human heredity. So in the past few chapters, we have learned about the genetics in general, using examples from all types of organisms. But in this chapter, we're focusing on humans. So first, here's some terms that we need to know. So a genome is the full set of genetic information that an organism has, it's the entire DNA code of an organism with every gene that it has. Chromosomes are bundles of DNA and protein. So um, DNA is really, really big molecule. It's easier for the cell to handle during cell division if it's nicely packaged up into chromosomes. And that also makes us easier to talk about uh, where things happen with the DNA. Remember that um, an individual gets a set of DNA from each parent. So there's two copies of each chromosome. Homologous chromosomes are the chromosomes from each parent that have the similar genes. They line up. And a karyotype is an image that arranges all of the individual's chromosomes with the homologous chromosomes paired up for comparison. And that's what we're going to look at next. So the genome of a human has 46 total chromosomes arranged into 23 pairs. And you can see that 22 of these pairs have two chromosomes that are nearly identical. Um, so you could kind of look at the shapes of these and the sizes and the banding patterns on them, and you'll see that um, most of them are pretty much identical. Like for this example, you've got the same pattern. They're roughly the same shape. And these that are the same, um, or these first 22 pairs, are called the autosomal chromosomes, where the one inherited from the mother and the one inherited from the father are pretty much the same. But then the last pair over here are the X and Y chromosomes. You can see that one is much bigger than the other. That's the X, and the Y is the smaller one. And these are called the sex chromosomes because they determine the sex of the individual. Humans with two X chromosomes are females, and humans with one X chromosome and one Y chromosome are males. So let's consider how these sex chromosomes work. Females have two X chromosomes, and males have one X and one Y chromosome. So during reproduction, these split so that the sex cells um, only have one sex chromosome. So the female makes eggs that each have an individual X. The male makes sperm. Some of those sperms get an X, some of them get a Y. Okay, so um, half of the sperm cells end up with an X, half with a Y, and then when reproduction happens um, with the fertilization of the eggs and the sperm, if an X egg and an X sperm come together, then the offspring is a female. But if a sperm with a Y chromosome fertilizes an egg, then the resulting offspring will be male. You may want to go back to chapter 11 and review some of Mendel's principles, because we're going to be using terms like recessive and dominant and co-dominant and multiple alleles, and these are all things that you learned about in Chapter 11. So again, you might want to review that to make sure it all makes sense. Now, the term sex-linked inheritance describes the inheritance of any traits that are controlled by the genes on the X or Y chromosomes. Okay, so those are the sex chromosomes, so genes linked to them are sex-linked inheritance. Now, um, the obvious thing would be that only males have Y chromosomes, so genes on that chromosome are only had by males. Uh, but what gets really interesting is females having two X chromosomes. So because the female has two copies, it doesn't really matter if one is defective. They have another copy that works. But if a male gets a defective X chromosome, it doesn't have a backup because the Y doesn't have the same genes on it. 
So um, males would only have to inherit one defective X chromosome in order to get that disorder. So females can carry the defective X chromosome but not display the trait, but males, if they have it in their single X chromosome, they're going to have that trait. Okay, and this is why um, disorders like colorblindness and hemophilia and baldness are more common in men than in women. So let's look at this example. We've got um, a female that has one damaged X chromosome that's going to have one of these disorders. Uh, we're going to say it's for colorblindness. So she's got a colorblind um, allele for on one of her X chromosomes. But that's okay because she has another one that doesn't have the defects, so she's not colorblind. Okay, so she is healthy, she's not affected. The dad has an X and a Y that are both fine, he's not affected. So here's the options of the offspring they could have. If um, both of the healthy X chromosomes are inherited, there's going to be a daughter that's healthy. If the affected X chromosome, the broken one, is inherited, but then she also gets the X chromosome from dad. This daughter is going to um, be a carrier. So she's got a copy of that bad chromosome, but that's okay because she's got another one that's not. So it's important to realize that females can carry the defective chromosome without displaying the trait. So she's still going to be healthy even though she's carrying it. But let's look at what happens with the males. You could, in, um, you could have a healthy son that's going to inherit um, one healthy X chromosome from mom and then the Y chromosome from dad, or an affected son if he inherits the bad chromosome from mom and then the Y from dad. So you can see that the only option that's affected with the disease is going to be the son. Okay, from this um, pairing of the mom and dad up here, you can't end up with a daughter that has the disease. Um, the only way to get a daughter that has the disease would be if um, an affected male um, mated with an effective, an affected female and then they got the uh, disease version of it. So the daughter would have to inherit two bad copies of the gene, which is pretty unlikely, um, whereas the males only have to inherit one bad copy of the gene. So again, the summary here is that sex-linked traits, um, if they are on the X chromosome, they're often displayed in males but not in females, but the females can just carry that gene and usually not have two copies of it so they don't show the trait. A pedigree, which you can see more about in your book on page 337, is a family tree that shows the presence or absence of a specific trait. Um, and these can be used to determine the genotypes of family members or determine whether traits are dominant or recessive or whether traits are sex linked. So um, here's how they work. They're set up like this where um, a square is a male and a circle is a female. And then um, whatever trait we're looking at, if it's a filled in solid color, they're affected by that trait. And then um, not filled in, or in this case, just plain white, um, they're not affected by that trait. So we're starting out with a male that's affected. Okay, so let's, um, well, I don't want to pick a disease. Let's um, just say whatever disease it is the male has and the female doesn't. And then these are their offspring. Um, so when you see a horizontal bar going between two people like this, that means um, that those had children together. And then um, when you go down a line, you go down to their children. So um, our parents up here, we're going to label them P for parent. And they had three children, one, two, and three. So we can see that um, one of their children was a male that has a disease, one was a female that didn't have the disease, and one was a female that does have the disease. Um, so then you could go on and say, okay, the, this person had children with this person over here, and then they had three children, and so on. And you could kind of use that to determine things about the traits. So let's look at this branch over here. 
um, we have a male that has the disease and a female that has the disease over here and then um, a child that doesn't have it that actually is going to help us figure out that this disease must be a dominant trait um, because if it was recessive um, so we're going to use lowercase d for recessive then the only way for the parents to have it would be is if they both had homozygous recessive alleles for it and if that was the case then their daughter could only inherit those alleles so there's no way that that would work so they can't be recessive but if they were dominant then each parent could have one so we'll say a capital d for dominant one dominant allele and one recessive allele and dad could have one dominant allele and one recessive allele and then if this daughter happened to inherit both recessive alleles then she won't have it so that's just something that you could determine using the pedigree so it's just important that you can remember what um, each one is so um, the squares and circles are males and females and filled in or not filled in is affected and not affected and then um, you know figure out who's married to who and who would, um, is the offspring of whom Okay, so the next section is about human genetic disorders. Um, so there's kind of two types that we look at. We look at disorders that are caused by only changes in one gene. And the three examples they give you are sickle cell disease, Huntington's disease, and cystic fibrosis. Uh, they're all serious diseases. The book describes what happens with each one, um, but they are caused by changes in one gene. So one protein is altered, and cannot function correctly and that affects the whole cell and um, it also mentions that sometimes diseases like this have silver linings so in humans with sickle cell disease which is an absolutely horrible disease um, but if you have sickle cell the malaria parasite can't live in your cells and so it makes the humans that have it resistant to malaria and in humans with cystic fibrosis if they have one cystic fibrosis allele they could still survive and then they're also resistant to typhoid which isn't something we worry too much about now but a few hundred years ago that was a big deal so those were single gene disorders and then you could also have chromosomal disorders so chromosomal disorders is where there's a problem that is on the chromosome level maybe you have extra chromosomes or missing chromosomes or chunks of chromosomes that are wrong um, so the most common chromosomal error is called um, non-disjunction and that's where in meiosis the two homologous chromosomes stick together instead of separating so when you have the daughter cells one daughter cell is going to have extra chromosome and the other one is going to be missing a chromosome and a common example of this would be down syndrome um, which is a trisomy of chromosome 21 meaning individuals with down syndrome have three copies of chromosome number 21 So there's a karyotype of someone with Down syndrome. You can see 21. There's three of them, but there's only two of the rest of them. Um, another example is called Turner syndrome. And uh, this is a non-disjunction of the X chromosome in which the female has only one X chromosome. And then the opposite kind of of that would be Klinefelter's syndrome, which is also the result of non-destruction of the X chromosome. Um, but this is the other version where um, you end up having two X chromosomes, but also a Y chromosome. So this person would be considered male because they have a Y chromosome, but then they also have two X's instead of one X. And that's called Klinefelter syndrome. And then the last section here is about studying the human genome. Um, so again, genome is the um, entirety of the DNA in a human. And so this is really, really basic. These are pretty technological things, but um, in general, the basic steps in studying DNA, um, restriction enzymes are used to cut the DNA into fragments. And those fragments have single-stranded ends. 
Gel electrophoresis is a technique used to separate the fragments, sorting them by size. So this, the fragments are put into these lanes. Um, they run through the gel. The bigger ones move slower. The faster ones move quicker. And so it separates them out. And then they actually sequence those chunks of DNA. So sequencing means reading its code. What order are the A's and T's and G's and C's in? So single-stranded fragments are put into a solution with nitrogenous bases. So the nitrogenous bases, again, are the A's and T's and G's and C's. Um, but they're put into a solution with some nitrogenous bases that are color-coded with chemical dyes. And so as they attach to the DNA, the researchers can kind of read those color codes to figure out the order that they are going to attach to the DNA. So um, again, that's because kind of the very basic overview. There's you know a lot of details to know about those steps, but we're not going to go over all those. You don't need to know all those details. So using this and other sequencing methods, uh, the Human Genome Project um, was a goal to figure out the genome of an entire set of nitrogenous bases in DNA and to identify all of the genes on the human genome. So again, the genome is the entire code of DNA in an organism. And the human genome is really, really huge. Um, it's about 3 billion base pairs. So it was done, started by the National Human Genome Research Institute started in 1990, but it took an international effort to sequence this entire set of nitrogenous bases in DNA. Um, it took 13 years, $2.7 billion, scientists in 20 different centers and six different countries. And we learned so much from doing that and so many new processes have been invented since then that now, today, an entire human genome can be sequenced in about 26 hours for just over $1,000. So we've come a long way um, since 1990 and even since 2003. So you may be wondering, wait, OK, so Human Genome Project, it took them 13 years to sequence just a set of DNA. Um, so how does that help us? Isn't everybody's DNA different? But actually, the DNA of all humans is almost completely identical. Only about 0.83% of the individual base pairs in DNA are different between individuals of the same sex. So that means that all people in the world are genetically over 99% exactly the same as other people of the same sex, excluding people with a chromosomal disorder. So basically, um, that means that studying the DNA of the few test individuals that they used in the Human Genome Project allowed us to map the genes of all of humanity. Almost all of our DNA is exactly the same. And basically, all of our genes are in the same places on the chromosomes. Everybody has um, kind of mostly the same genes. They just are different alleles of them that code for slightly different things. Okay, and so I wanted to mention things like genetic ancestry and health tests. So you might have seen these Ancestry.com and 23andMe, where you can send them um, a sample and they will test your DNA and tell you lots of cool things like what your um, ancestry is, what parts of the world your, your family developed from. Um, and they can also look for um, different health issues that might arise based on your DNA. So how these work is they don't sequence your entire genome. They just focus on areas that are likely to be different. So again, 99, over 99% of our DNA is all the same. Because um, if you think about all the things that all of our bodies have to do, you know, we have to have cells that make the same parts and that function the same way. Um, so you know, most of our DNA is the same. So they ignore those parts and they look at the parts that are most likely to be different between people. And those are the areas that they check. 
Um, so again, they look for genetic markers that determine which regions of the world your ancestors came from. Um, they have genetic markers that can alert to high likelihoods of some diseases. Now, just because you see those genetic markers in your result does not mean that you have that disease, but it just means that you are more likely to have it. But with this, um, there's concerns about the privacy. Um, so there are some laws in place to prevent discrimination from health insurance and hiring due to genetic markers. Um, but there are some loopholes. Um, for example, employers um, can kind of strong arm people into taking genetic tests. There's um, an issue with wellness policies, um, employer wellness policies where um, they can kind of see at, at the moment, I believe they can kind of uh, strong arm you into taking the test and say, well, if you don't release genetic test results to us, you're going to have to pay more for your wellness policy. Um, and that's kind of not cool, but I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen with that. There's some laws in Congress that they tried to pass and they didn't get passed. And so it's, it's a current issue that they're getting trying to get figured out how to solve this problem. Um, Life insurance companies can also refuse to give you life insurance based on the results of a genetic test. Um, these companies, 23andMe and Ancestry.com, they generally don't keep your results. So they don't have on file something that says, well, John sent us this DNA, this is John's DNA, this is John's results, because they don't want to know that information, they don't want to be responsible for that information. So what they do is just kind of throw it out um, and they, they kind of aggregate the data. So they don't have any information that says like, this is John's DNA. They'll say, well, this is the DNA from a thousand people. And John was one of them, but we don't know which one, just here's a thousand people so that they have the data. Um, so that's cool of them. So there's not too much of a worry about their data being leaked that way. But I'd be more concerned about the the other things where the, the employers can kind of say, well, we need you to take a genetic test and give us the results. So it's all a big issue. There's not really a big um, answer to it. It's something that's trying to be solved now. And that does bring us to the end of this chapter, but if you have any questions, don't hesitate to get in contact with an instructor.